Let's continue with our exercises. Wayao, are you on? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Okay, so uh, uh, if you, you still didn't get a corner environment to work at this point, uh, then you can simply use in this uh, binder link. So I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with binder now because yesterday Jean-Francois uh, exercises are, are uh, uh, all uploaded to the Spender uh, website. So just Wait, go to, yes? Do you mind turning on your camera so that we can see you? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I forgot to turn that back on. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, if you have the condo environment, now you can uh, activate uh, the Trento based environment and open the Jupyter notebook. Uh, if you don't, simply click on this binder link, it will take you to uh, the, the notebook over here. So if, uh, if you are able to open the notebooks now, uh, click on the first example we're going to work on is the simple Gaussian process emulator. The simple Gaussian process notebook. Okay, the, you will see a, a block like this. So uh, can I do a poll that's to make sure that everybody is able to uh, open uh, the notebook like this. Please click yes if you are able to open the notebook like this. So we got 30, 41 yeses and no no's. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, for those using Binder, uh, uh, sometimes uh, be because some of our example requires uh, quite a amount of computing, so there are some examples you won't be able to, to run very quickly on Binder, but uh, in other cases, I have provided you some pre-generated data, so you won't be uh, uh, stuck on, on just running the, the code. Uh, so if you now press shift plus enter of this first block, it should load the, the uh, required modules. And uh, this, in this, process, uh, in, in this uh, example, we, we give uh, a, a brief example of how Gaussian process works and uh, what it's used for and what's not used for. So our goal is to interpolate a function on a sparse grid. So this function uh, is this fx uh, as function of, uh, is function of a linear piece plus uh, oscillation piece. If you run this block, and we're going to generate uh, uh, the design value. So, so remember design is a carefully chosen set of points where we actually run the full model. In this case, the model is a simple function. So we're going to choose to compute the value of the function at minus one, minus 0 0.5, 0, 0.5 and one, such five points. You run through the third block, it computes uh, its value. And in the first block, uh, what's plotted is the, the true value of the function within a uh, domain of minus one to one with the five design points. So, 
now the 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 task we want to do is to use just these five right points and Gaussian process emulator to guess to infer the full functional dependencies of the original function. So Gaussian process emulator works uh, by correlating the outputs. So for example, if I just give you these five points, in a linear, uh, in a lin linear interpolator, uh, you're simply connecting adjacent uh, red dots by a straight line. So you are using two values to interpolate anything in between. If you choose the quadratic formula uh, to fit quadratic, you need three points. So you are actually using uh, the correlation between three data points to make predictions uh, for those values in between. So for Gaussian process, if you want to produce a, a prediction at one point, it actually uses the correlation with all the data points you give it. So. So it's only it's, it's purely making predictions by assuming the way how one data point, how one output correlates with your known output. So because uh, we are using this correlation method, uh, you have to assume how, uh, what, what this correlation, uh, correlation structure looks like, which is this kernel function. So this kernel function is the constant in, in this block, if it runs through it. This kernel function tells you how the output at one point correlates at output of another point. So in more physical words, it's uh, something like the two point function uh, between uh, two, if you think of this, uh, this unknown function form as a one dimensional random field, then it's simply specifying the two-point functions. In this case, our two-point function take this, uh, it's actually Gaussian, but uh, in the Gaussian emulator uh, cases, we call it uh, squared exponentials. So it has a uh, constant pieces times a decaying factor, uh, times a uh, exponentially decaying factor. So the, the further apart you are in the input space, the less correlated you are in the output, output space. The closer you are in input space, uh, the more tightly correlated you are in the output space. And then uh, using the Gaussian process with such a kernel, uh, we've tried to fit the given date five data points by simply calling this gp.fit. Uh, we pass it the design values we generated and uh, uh, the corresponding functional uh, output Y design. And at the end, you can see there's uh, some output over here. So this correlation function, it has uh, two parameters. One is the variance C and another is the correlation length L. Oh, sorry. This is a square. So these two values are not uh, known ahead of fitting to the data. So when you fit to the data, the Gaussian process emulator will determine what the, the best values for this C parameter and L parameters, we call them hyperparameters, are. Uh, so the criterion is that uh, you have to give a pretty good description of all the given data points while not making the functional looks too complex uh, to prevent overfitting. So here you see that after the fit, uh, my version of Gaussian process gave me that the, the uh, autocorrelation, the C, is about 2.23, and the correlation length is about uh, 0.36. So it's important to check whether these numbers are reasonable, because the autocorrelation or the variance of the Gaussian process should roughly correspond to uh, the range of y values of your y function. In this case, it's actually uh, pretty close. So your, your y fun function varies from minus three to three, and the fitted covariance is, from, uh, is about 2.2. And this length of correlation uh, tells Gaussian process how, uh, how quickly it, it can change its prediction from one input to the next. Therefore, if you have the input 
that ranges from minus one to one, it's very unlikely for a smooth function to have this correlation length very small or very large compared to one. So in this case, the Gaussian process gets its best value is about 0.36. So that's also reasonable. Once you see there are very small or very large numbers over here, it probably means that uh, the, the training process of Gaussian process doesn't complete very successfully, or you're just uh, fitting a constant function or pure noise. So now go ahead. Uh, in the next block, there is a function that uh, takes uh, it's a, a wrapper uh, I've written for you. Uh, it simply used the pass through the Gaussian process GP you have trained and an arbitrary input you want to make predictions to it and it will return the mean value of the prediction and the standard deviation of the prediction. So if you run through the next two, two uh, blocks, you should get a, a colorful plot like this. So, so here, again, you have the true value of the function, which is the black line. And uh, the five design points are labeled by red. The Gaussian process's mean prediction uh, is uh, shown in the blue dashed line. So it's, you, you see it's uh, very close to, in this case, the Gaussian process is doing a very good job in guessing what the original function looks like, given just five points. Uh, but what's more meaningful is to look at this mean along with the uncertainty it produced. So Gaussian process is, as I said, a fancier version of interpolator, but it also, more than just the interpolator, it also predicts its own interpolation uncertainties. So here I have plotted the one sigma and two sigma band uh, of the interpolation uncertainty to so see that for most of the cases, the, the true value of the, the function should, follow, uh, should fall in that uh, two sigma or if you want to be more careful, three sigma band. Uh, in this case, because this function is rather simple, uh, it's actually doing a little, a little better than we expected. Almost all the black curves fall in the one sigma band. So are there any questions regarding uh, this demo at this point? Because we're going to start to change some of its uh, parameters uh, and we make sure you have uh, understand what's going on. So if the function you had uh, would be more fluctuating, then there's a higher chance that the interpolated, uh, that, the, that the function that you gave falls outside the one sigma or two sigma range of the yeah. interpolator. Yes, so uh, for example, if I just uh, have a constant value uh, a function with constant value, then the Gaussian emulator can reproduce something uh, with a constant mean, and then, then that, that constant mean will be perfect in predicting uh, the variation. But they have a very uh, nonlinear function that changes abruptly and also changes nonlinearly. When you vary the input, it's harder for it to, to learn its behavior. So now, up to this point, we have only been doing uh, interpolations. So another point I want to make is, uh, is interpolation is usually fine, but uh, when you want to do extrapolation using Gaussian process, you need to be very careful. Okay, before you go on, there is okay. an interesting question here. Namely, does the correct behavior of the emulator depend on the correctly choosing the design points? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Can, can this be a problem? Yes, actually, let, yeah, let's, let, let's do that exercise first. So if you go back to where you, you compute the design points, uh, if you all follow me, let's not make this uh, equally distributed uh, linear design. Let's make just a random design. So if you may follow me to change act design not equals to this area I give you, but uh, just some uh, random samples pulled from uniform distribution from minus one to one, five points. Uh, I will give you some point if you want to uh, copy this command into your notebook. Okay, uh, if you're done, again, run through all the blocks. 
Yeah. So see, in this case, I, I happen to choose uh, some design points. Some of them are too close to each, each other. And on the left-hand side of the plot, I, I, don't, I didn't choose any design points. So there's a large gap. So in this case, the right part of the function are emulated very well with very tiny uncertainty by the Gaussian emulator. However, on the left, we have actually no design points. Uh, the uncertainty is very large. But you see, even though the uncertainty is large, the uncertainty band of the Gaussian process emulator also uh, expanded. So, uh, so in this particular case, you, use, you still get the true value within 90% credible region. Uh, well, this, is, this is what you got for you, random selection. Every student yes. would get a different one, right? Uh, I think I set the random seed, so they should yeah, I think I said a random seed. I think everybody should be getting a similar result. Uh, but if not, you can just uh, put in, oh, because sometimes maybe different version of NumPy can have different random seed, could be a case. Uh, let's just put in some, some arbitrary value by hand. Uh, for example, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, minus one, uh, the order doesn't really matter. And uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. Five is not in the range. Oh, sorry. It's actually 0 0.5. Yeah. yeah. So I have uh, most of the points in the positive axis and I've only got one point in the negative axis. Uh, so let's see what it does. Yeah. So again, uh, the, the, in, in places where you have uh, many design points, you have a very good accuracy. Once there's a large gap in your design, uh, the uncertainty band gets larger, but uh, uh, that's where the uncertainty becomes important. Because if you, you don't have any information on the one sigma and two sigma band, and just compare the blue curve, a blue, blue curve with uh, the black curve, uh, you can you, you you can get a very large discrepancy factor, but actually the Gaussian emulator is uh, no, it's it's not doing very well in this region, so it's predicting a very large uncertainty. There's one question here that I don't see a TA answering. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can just read it. Shouldn't a third of the black curve fall outside the one sigma band? Yeah, in principle, yes, on, on average. But I think in this case, this function is, uh, uh, like as I said, if you, you've, you've just put in the constant function, then, then it, it always overlaps the mean. So, so of course, if you've seen this function, you, you know that, okay, uh, in this case, it, it happens to always fall in this 60% uh, range. But uh, consider a case where if I didn't put on this black curve, then you cannot really exclude the possibility of some of the, the curve actually showing the gray range. Uh, actually, after this exercise, uh, you're encouraged to try more crazy functions. For example, a function that oscillates faster, that changes magnitude, uh, more, more of magnitudes as function of the input, and see uh, if you can make the Gaussian emulator break at some point. Okay, so a final modification I want you to make is actually to use Gaussian process to make extrapolations and see what comes out. So first, let us change it back to the original design. Minus one, minus 0 0.5, zero, 0 0.5, and one. And in this last block, when you make predictions, uh, don't make prediction that just we see minus one to one, make prediction from minus two to two. And this is what you get. So we see minus one to one, 
is similar to the previous result. But once you get outside of the design range, basically you have a, not just a gap, you, you have uh, absolutely no information beyond that point, uh, Gaussian process will, will not do a good job in extrapolating the data. It will just return in uh, its agnostic state without any training information, basically uh, a random function with zero mean and the two, uh, a standard deviation of two. Uh, of course, I have to, to acknowledge that uh, there are some uh, 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 practices that you can, or, or, or tricks you can do in the Gaussian process in order to make reasonable predictions. Uh, but for our cases, we are mainly using it as an extrapolation. And it's very sometimes dangerous to, to make e extrapolations. I think we are caught up with questions. You can move on. Okay. So that's the, uh, you can close this box. This now you can play with it later. Uh, okay. Sorry, one, one more question. Yeah. From, can we include uncertainty in the training samples so that for instance, oh, yes. uncertainty bands won't close at zero to zero at the design points? So I think here uh, it's possible if you go back to this block, training the emulator, I think you can put an alpha parameter over here. Uh, the exact meaning of this alpha, I need to look, look back into the, the, uh, the documentation of, of, uh, of this uh, implementation. But it allows that at each point uh, of the design point, uh, you, you, do, you don't require the Gaussian emulator to, to be forced to passing through that point. You can have a finite error in this case. Yeah, see, once you include that alpha parameter, uh, this band doesn't have to go to zero at the design point. Yeah. For example, if the training points stem from a stochastic model like URQMD, which has a sampling error, how would you determine that alpha based on that sampling error from? Oh, that, uh, so, so one thing is the, the alpha. Another thing you can do is to, if you don't use the, this alpha parameter, is to add a white noise kernel. Uh, so in this case, the correlation function will be added the diagonal piece with some uh, noise level that prevents you from have to pass in through every point in your uh, design. And this noise level is also optimized when you fit the Gaussian process to train data. So it can, uh, in some sense, estimate the level of noise in your data. I think that answered the question. Yeah. Okay, now you can close this exercise. We'll move to the next one. So the next one is the, the simple PCA example, the simple principal component analysis. This one. So, so the first block is the same. We, we load almost the same library. So, so like I said, we, we, <coughs> we use principal component analysis to reduce something with a very high dimensional data, uh, some that data with very high, high dimension to just a few effective degrees of freedom. So that by only mimicking a few numbers, we can capture most of the variational behavior of that high dimensional data. High dimensional data. So, so here we, we try to demonstrate with an explicit, explicit example. So for example, I have a function f. So this function f uh, has input x but also has three control parameters, A and B and C. So what it looks like, it has an exponential piece. Uh, 
and uh, a Gaussian piece. And a noise. Currently, I said the noise level to be very low, so you can uh, think of this. There, there's effectively uh, uh, no statistical noise right now. We'll come back to this later. So if you just uh, plot a function with an arbitrary choice of a, b, and c, in this case, a equals to 1, b equals to minus 1, c equals to 1, and you choose 20 points, uh, you, you get the prediction uh, of the function. So this is the, uh, emulating that. So, so the correspondence of this simple function with our actual model is that x, you can think of as the label of observables. And a, b, c, these control parameters, uh, you can think of, for example, in, in hydrodynamic model, the shear viscosity, some other physical parameters you want to understand. And you, from experiments, you get one measurement of this f, and you, you want to tune ABC so that you, you, you see uh, at some point you, you can reproduce that uh, curve you measure. So the noise was zero in this example? Uh, currently, it's very small. It's uh, uh, 10 to the minus 5, so effectively zero effectively zero. Now, we vary, we, we sample all kinds of A, B, and C. So here we sample the A parameters, B parameters, and C parameters uh, uh, from a normal distribution. So A and B are standardized normal, uh, are pulled from standardized normal distribution. Uh, C is pulled from a uh, normal distribution with uh, mean at 0.5 and uh, standard deviation one. And for each combination of A, B, C, we can plot what this function looks like. So after you run through block six, you, get, you should get uh, 100 curves over here. So it's all overlapped together. But uh, uh, that's the scenario you're, you're going to get when you start to do Bayes analysis you vary a few parameters and you are uh, produ producing a ton of predictions, each labeled by observables one to 20. So it's uh, quite impractical to, to try to learn how each of them behave as a function of A, B, and C. And we know it's not necessary because there's only three degrees of freedom we put in Inside this function, you really don't need to build 20 different independent uh, interpolators to, to explain how each point uh, vary as function of a, 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 B, and C. That's what uh, the principal comp competent analysis is used for. So if you go to the next uh, block. So, so this block is actually a block we are going to also use in the in the in the big example. So, because there are many details in using this uh, uh, principal component analysis implemented by by the Python package uh, scikit learn, I, I write this uh, class to wrap a lot of the details and uh, just to take care of the most important functionalities. Uh, of the PC uh, principal component analysis we're going to use. So, so to, to, to use this, uh, this class, uh, simply passing the data generated uh, to declare an object of the class. So this data is that 100 different choices of a combination of ABC and its prediction of the 20 uh, 20, 20, 20 different observables. So it's actually a 20, uh, 100 by 20 matrices. And the principal components, uh, this number is actually letting you, to, letting you choose how many number of principal components or effective degrees of freedom you want to keep at the end. Let's start with two, actually. We just keep two, two principal components. Okay, 
And in the next block, it will plot some important features of the principal component. Uh, just run it, I will explain the plot. Okay, here. So the first of this plot uh, is, is demonstrating how important every principal component is. So it's the cumulative fraction of variance carried by each principal component. So if you, you look at the data points, uh, original data points, it varies uh, drastically uh, 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 from, for example, uh, let me see, from minus one to one, I think. Okay, from minus, about minus two to two. But here, uh, this plot means that by just including one principal component and the tune that proportionality constant, you're actually capturing 60% of the total variance in the original data. So this first principal component is the most important one. So the next red dot means if you include the next principal component, uh, the combined variance you get by the linear combination of these two principal components is counted, already counted for maybe 87% of the total variance. Of course, you can include in more principal components, the number of principal components simply equals to the number of uh, data points you have because it's uh, just of some matrix transformation, linear combinations, you are really not losing any information. What's lost is when you choose to truncate such a transformation at a finite number of principal components. So what this principal component looks like in real space, you can take a look on the right figure. Oh, maybe I should add the label over here. Okay, so on the right of the figure, uh, so principal components are linear combination of the original observables. So in this case, the principal component one has this, uh, as function of x, has this uh, a broad peak around 2.5. Principal component two is a linear increasing shape, something like a linear function within this domain. And the principal component three has another peak structure. So it's not necessarily that uh, uh, each of these principal components has to relate to part of the, the original function, what it looks like. It's just an effective way to parameterize how the function changes uh, when you vary its parameters. Now, given just two principal components, now remember that we have reducing the curve with 20 sampling points, uh, 20 X points in just two numbers. So how accurate is this? So we can uh, choose how many features we want to include and transform it back to the original space. Uh, currently, because we are only including two principal components, uh, let's comment out this third one. So you, 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 you get something like, like this. So, so this is the prediction from the principal component. Uh, but of course, uh, you, you don't know how much, uh, how well it, it, it reproduced the data. So what you can do is you can minus, uh, you can subtract the, the, the correct value you get from the data. Oh, data is not defined. Oh, capital data. This is your residual error for the predictions. Uh, of course, since we're only including two principal components, uh, right now this accuracy is not very well. So now go back to where we choose how many principal um, Wei Yao, I, I believe some people may start to be falling behind a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So maybe you can just slow down for a second and uh, at, while we're waiting, address one question. Um, a general question, could you explain a little bit more what the principal component um, 
analysis is. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, I really want to cover this more in the lecture, but uh, 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 so, okay, here. So, so here, take a look at this function. So you have some, some uh, data. generated by a set of specific parameters. And in parameter fit, you want to vary your parameters to see how your predictions changes along with different parameter set. So eventually you are going to get a ton of predictions at different input parameters. For example, in this case, uh, you can generate uh, uh, one, uh, six sets of different input parameters and at in each input parameter set, you have 20 observables. And maybe it will help you to understand better if I put in some uh, more, more, some, some more, more close to our context. For example, this could be V2, V3, could be multiplicity of pi on, multiplicity of, pro, uh, 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 of charge particle. Okay, and this A and B could be, for example, the initial energy normalization factor, uh, viscosity, and so on. Uh, and now we only generate six, a finite set of this uh, mapping from the parameter space to the observable space, and we want to do interpolations. So the naive way to do it is to first to look at the first column of it and try to interpolate how V2 changes as function of all these parameters. And then once you have done that, you, you build a separate Gaussian emulator to, to emulate v, how V3 changes as a function of uh, the parameters and then so on for Uh, the multiplicities. However, you, you, you realize that that's not necessary because if some parameters gives you a very large pi multiplicity, it's very probable it's going, also going to increase the charge particle multiplicity. So in the sense that you only have, uh, instead of two independent variables, uh, you have effectively more, a little more than one degrees of freedom between multiplicity of pi on and charge particle multiplicities. So instead of just mimicking this observable, you can mimic in, for example, the, multiplicity, the average multiplicity of pi plus uh, charge particle, you do transformation and the differences between, uh, uh, for example, the differences between pi on and charge particles. So in this case, uh, the differences will change less uh, than the, 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 <coughs> the addition, uh, just as, as, as an example, uh, when you vary some parameters. So most of the, the feature of the data are completely contained inside how the total number changes. So of course, we just build this basis, uh, this basis by, by some simple observations so principal component analysis is a more systematic way to find uh, this biased basis. So this new basis is actually new observable. It's actually a linear combination of the original observables. So that this new observable does not contain pairwise correlations so that uh, uh, you, you, you won't have a uh, have scenario where uh, some parameters increases the one of the new observables by a factor of two 
also increase the not absorbed by a factor of two. So, so in principle, they are built so that they are linearly uncorrelated. And this is give you a very effective basis to represent this high dimensional data with just a, a few uncorrelated principal components. Because like I said, once you do this uh, transformation, not all of them are important. For example, if two of your observables always move up and down in the similar fashion, then probably in this near combination, you are going to find a particular combination between these two observables, which, which is the subtraction of the two, which always stays very close to zero. So this new observable doesn't matter too much. So that's uh, a, a qualitative way to understand how this dimensional reduction is possible. And if you add another parameter to your study, then you have to recompute all the principal components. Right? Yes. Yes, so it's trying to guess uh, what's the intrinsic variation of this high dimensional data, whether it can be represented by fewer degrees of freedom. Okay, so if there's no further questions, uh, I would like to, to increase the number of principal components over here. Let's increase it to three and run through the whole thing again. Oh, so in this case, you need to add this third component back. So you see that once you include three principal component, uh, the uncertainty gets better. So the discrepancy is not as large as it before, but uh, it's, it's still not as good as it should be. So you can try including more and more principal components until you get uh, the truncation uncertainty under control. Okay, let me check the time. Okay. So, so these two examples just for you to, uh, some simple example you can also use in the future just to get familiar with these ideas. Uh, in our later big examples, they are all uh, wrapped in, in classes or functions, so you don't have to deal with uh, details over there. Okay, then I'm going to close this example. We can have uh, more discussions if you want on Slack. So, so now we have this uh, final example on uh, Bayesian analysis of Trento. So because this will require uh, some computations, uh, uh, I will exit from this binder, but, but if you're already on binder, don't exit, uh, and uh, try to use my local version of this notebook. Okay. So, so again, just the overview of the Trento initial condition and what uh, we are going to vary inside this. Uh, oh, oh, maybe I should uh, I should do another pool. So, is everybody uh, uh, at this point uh, looking at this notebook right now? This Trento base notebook. Yes, it's not ticking up. We are at 27. Forty-two, which forty-three, which approaches the number of active participants. So okay, great. Uh, 
So if you have time, you can uh, uh, read the, the documentations carefully, but uh, 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 so, so basically this first section is just an overview of the model, uh, which is the, the same content as the, the one presenting in the lecture. So this initial condition model has many degrees of freedom. The energy deposition relation parameter P, uh, the nuclear and wise parameter, uh, parameter controlling the fluctuation, uh, the minimum nuclear distance parameter, and finally, uh, uh, energy density normalization tuned to different system at different beam energies. Uh, sorry, tuned to different beam energies. And we just want to use this model as an example to see uh, this whole workflow of Bayesian calibration, how it works on multiple parameters and multiple observables. Uh, the example I gave you before only deals with 1D input, one dimensional output. Or so, so in this case, uh, the, the workflow in this notebook is more closer to a, a, a full scale model. Actually, this notebook, uh, I think is quite useful sometimes for my own project. If it's not too big, I, I just do some uh, simple modification to this notebook and it's already uh, uh, set satisfies most of my re requirements. Uh, so in the first round, I will just uh, let you through this notebook so that everybody can successfully run, run each, each block and there's no, no, no questions uh, there in this first run. And again, after that, we will start to take some modifications. So it runs through the first few blocks uh, loading all the uh, modules and settings. And the first step is actually make design. So we have seen in, uh, in the earlier Gaussian process example, uh, the design points are very important. For the one dimensional cases, uh, if you make the uniform, uh, sorry, if you make a, a grid design, equally spaces design point, uh, you get a very good uh, accuracy uh, on all the uh, uh, range of the input, but if you choose a random design where you have uh, a large gap between design points, uh, the uncertainty, the prediction uncertainty become, becomes quite large. So it's very imperative to choose uh, a reasonable design points. However, it's for high dimensional parameter space, it's not uh, practical to, 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 to choose a high dimensional grid. For example, we have five number of parameter, uh, five parameters in that one, sorry, five design points in that one dimensional example. For this five parameter case, if we simply choose five parameters per dimension, you are end up with five to the power of five design points. That's uh, 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 still just too much uh, to run the full model. So here we are using something in between of a grid, grid design and the random design is called the Latin hypercube design. So it's something like a, a random design, but it's trying to maximize the minimum distance between design points so that you don't end up with very tight clustered design points or some large, cap, large gap in the design points. So just run through the, the, the following two blocks. It will load a pre-generated design to the notebook. And, oh, by, by the way, so you may notice that when you run, I pass a notebook, the, the line number will, will change when we run the script. So if you want to ask questions for this uh, quite long notebook, please refer to this uh, block number I put over here. For example, if you want to ask uh, a question regarding this block, just uh, type block three questions over here for reference. And, and run through block three. Okay. Uh,
Okay, actually, uh, let me go back to the web version because I'm not on my laptop. Okay, so yeah, run through the design points. So we we have uh, generated a hundred parameter sets, and uh, one thing I want to do is to to see what this uh, Latin hypercube design does and why it's uh, better for uh, training emulators than just a random design or a grid design. So, so the advantage over the grid design where I talk about, uh, the grid design will, will simply take too much, uh, uh, too much points when you, you sample equal number of points in each dimension. So Latin Hypercube with a, a fairly smaller number of design points, you can achieve a quite good coverage uh, of sampling the parameter space. So if you run through this block, so that's block number four. So this plot will tell you why this Latin hypercube design is better than random design. So on the left, it's the one, param uh, it's the one parameter distribution of the sample between the Latin hypercube sampling and the random sampling. So see random sampling really has this uh, very large fluctuations while Latin hypercube design always guarantees that uh, this uh, marginalized one parameter distribution, even though you only have 100 parameter sets, is always very close to, the, to a, uniform, a uniform distribution. How did you arrive at the number 100? Oh, the number 100 is, uh, uh, the pregenerated design has 100 design points. So it's- Yes, uh, but, but why did you generate 100 design oh, points? See. Oh, okay, I see your question. So uh, the number of design you need is uh, indeed a very tricky question. So uh, ideally you want to use as many design points as possible. So you have a, a very good interpolation of certainty under control, but you have to, to truncate number uh, somewhere. So, uh, statisticians always say that uh, uh, for a smooth enough functions, uh, this Latin hypercube design, the number of points you need are proportional to the number of dimensions. But uh, this, this breaks the question down to uh, what's the proportionality constant. So usually we choose uh, some number much larger than the one, of course, maybe 10 or 20. So for, for this case, I choose uh, 20. So, so that 20 times the number of dimensions gives you 100 design points. Uh, but of course, how do you know this number of design points is enough for the accuracy I need? Uh, you have to check this in the so-called closure test uh, to see how much uncertainty introduced by using this particular number of design points. Thank you. So on the right of uh, this figure, these two plots, I compare the two parameter, uh, in this case, the P parameter and the nuclear West parameter samples as scattered plots for lateral hypercube design and random design. So uh, you, you see that for Latin hypercube design, uh, it kind of fills the, the space quite uniformly of course, you have tightly uh, look. There's something look like a tight clustered region, but that's because you are projecting out other dimensions of the parameters. However, for random design, uh, you can see you not only get this tight cluster uh, design points, you also have this uh, very large gap. For example, around p equals to zero and uh, w equals to 0.6. 
Therefore, when you do a random design, you will inevitably run into regions where you have uh, very little design points and your emulator uncertainty uh, becomes very large in that region. So that's, uh, so for this re two reasons, uh, we usually use this Latin hypercube design to pull samples from the parameter space and run the full model. Is there any further questions regarding the design procedure? Nothing on Slack. Okay. Okay, after the design comes the most uh, time consuming part of the, uh, of the Bayesian analysis is to actually run the physical model <coughs> on the design parameters. So, so uh, uh, like I said, for hydro-based simulations, uh, you, uh, you only get like order 10 events per hour. Uh, for, for Trento, it's much faster. It's just in this condition, you get order 100 events per second. But even for such a speed, uh, uh, it's not practical to really run Trento model at, at this point. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, get, for example, 10,000 minimum bias event, which is really not a lot, uh, that will take you uh, one or two minutes for, uh, for example, one minute for one parameter point, and we have 100 parameter point over here. So that's uh, going to take a lot of time. Uh, this block five is a Python wrapper to call Trento. If you have your own time, you can try uh, download the Trento standalone version and generate your own design, uh, design calculations. But for the, this exercise, uh, we are not going to do that. So you just run through all this block to block seven. And the block eight and block nine. Uh, so, we'll, so, so this is the observables we try to compare with the experiments. So we, we, we particularly pick two sets of our observables that are more sensitive to initial conditions rather than uh, the dynamics, uh, which is the centrality dependent transverse energy and also <coughs> uh, the, the <coughs> epsilon two and epsilon three uh, a soft normalized distribution as a close estimate for the flow soft normalized distributions. And, and here you can find the reference for the experiments. And for this observables, we are going to load our pre-generated calculations in block 10 and 11. So go ahead, run block 10 and 11. So for those running since on binder, block 11 may take some time because it's not as fast as your uh, local computer. So, so this is the, generally the, the, the first plot you, you, you get after uh, uh, generated design points, which is how each design points predict the observables from the full model calculations. So here you see on the left, we have uh, uh, in, uh, in total 100, <coughs> 100 lines of uh, energy versus centrality. On the right, uh, we have the flow distribution represented by the eccentricity distributions. Of course, uh, like you see this uh, eccentricity distributions observable is really uh, statistical hungry. So with this about uh, uh, 100,000 events I generate, you still don't get uh, 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 all the fine structures at the long tail. So instead of just comparing these observables, we're, on, we're only going to compare the width of this distribution and the schoolness of this distribution between uh, experiments and calculations. So are there any questions in generating uh, uh, model calculation at each design point? Because for, for your own analysis, this step will take the most of the time. It's only because we have a pre-generated calculation that it only takes seconds for this to complete. 
OK. So now we organize, if, if, if you're still- I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, my, my, my mic was moved. There was a question addressing a couple of blocks back. Um, how was the 40 to 45 centrality chosen for epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 in block 9? Uh, so uh, this is only for demo, the demonstration process, uh, the purpose. So I'm only picking one uh, centrality classes where uh, from the slides you can see you, you actually get some sensitivity at this centrality on the parameter P. Uh, in principle, you can include much more data sets, much more data sets, uh, more centralities, more collision system. Uh, but I think currently this is enough just for demonstration. Yeah. Now, the students who are trying to actually do this, they are having problems of the computing taking time. So I don't think they have arrived at these figures. Are you insisting on the students doing the, this by themselves or what's, what's your intent here? Uh, actually, I think to this point, uh, up to block 11, they shouldn't uh, Maybe you should take a poll. Take much time. Can you take a poll? Yeah. Okay. So, so f if everybody has uh, reached block eleven and generated this plot, please uh, press yes. Wow! Well, yeah, how much more material do you have to go? Uh, another twenty blocks. Another twenty blocks. Uh, Time-wise, what's your estimate? Uh, I still got this is my last uh, notebook, so I still got one over for that. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps let's take a five minute break. Oh, oh yeah, sure, sure. For everybody to catch up. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, we have about one more hour to go. Okay. <laughs>